My name is Carolyn Evans. I'm the Dean of the Law School. And it's my very great pleasure to welcome here to the fourth annual Francis Gurry Lecture, tonight to be delivered by the Honourable Robert French, Chief Justice of Australia, on the topic, A Public Law Perspective on Intellectual Property. I begin by acknowledging that we meet here today on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Can I begin by saying tonight how proud we are of the Law School's pioneering leadership in the teaching and research of intellectual property in Australia, and particularly for an international reputation founded on multidisciplinary research on intellectual property. We're very proud as part of that to bring you this annual lecture series. Tonight's proceeding will be, as you can probably see, recorded and will be available on the website after the lecture. The Francis Gurry Lectureship was established by the Melbourne Law School School and the Institute of Patent and Trademark Attorneys of Australia in 2009 in honour of the World Law School's distinguished alumnus and World Intellectual Property Organisation Director, Dr Francis Gurry. While Dr Gurry sends his apologies tonight, we are very pleased that his brother, Bill Gurry, has been able to join us this evening. The first Francis Gurry lecture was delivered by Francis Gurry himself in 2009 on the topic Intellectual Property, Innovation and Creativity, Future Global Directions. The second by Alison Brimlow in 2010 on not seeing the wood for the trees, is the patent system still fit for purpose? And the third by James Love last year on delinking intellectual property from exclusive rights. So we've covered a very wide range of topics over the last few years. My colleague Andrew Christie uh, will introduce the Chief Justice in a moment. Can I just take this time to acknowledge Andrew Christie's leadership and work as the convener of the lecture series and the person who's been behind tonight's lecture and also to acknowledge and thank the hardworking staff from the law school who've helped make tonight happen. So I'd now like to invite my colleague, Professor Andrew Christie, Chair of Intellectual Property and Convener of the series, to introduce tonight's guest speaker. Uh, thank you, Dean. Um, on behalf of the Institute of Patent and Trademark Attorneys of Australia and the Melbourne Law School, I want to add uh, to the Dean's welcome my own welcome. Um, it's fantastic to see such a great crowd here. The football commentators use the cliche that's record breaking. Um, this is actually record breaking in two respects. Uh, we've had wonderful, wonderful audiences for the past three Gary lectures, over 350 in each case, but tonight with 550 registrations and then stopped because we were worried we couldn't hold the full number. We've clearly bro broken that record. I'm also told, though, that it's the largest number of registrations for any public lecture that we've had in the law school ever. So if the Chief Justice's CV needed any burnishing, um, he could add a record breaker to it, but um, as, you'll, as you know already, he doesn't actually need any burnishing of his CV. I thank IPTA for the fact that they uh, joined with the law school to establish this event. I thank them very much indeed. And I also thank a couple of other organisations who've added their support to the lecture series, not just tonight, but the past couple of years. IP Australia, AIPPI Australia, FICP Australia, and the Licensing Executive Society of Australia and New Zealand Lesans. Those organisations have given us additional financial support and encouragement um, to allow us to have establish what's been so far a great series and will continue to be so. Francis Gurry, as uh, the Dean indicated, is an alumnus of the law school. Not so many people are aware that he was also an academic member of staff of the law school and some of my colleagues have had the privilege of either, being, of either teaching with Francis or being taught by Francis. I'm in the latter case. I was a student that Francis taught uh, in the early 1980s. And anybody who knows Francis uh, personally and through his work know that uh, he is a great Australian. Uh, he's the highest ranking Australian in the United Nations agency system. Um, and he got there by merit. And I say that uh, it's important when you talk about a United Nations agency to emphasise that. <laughs> I, I'm not, <laughs> not trying to criticise anything, but it really is. Um, at he, when he left the law school, he went into private practice and from there to Geneva and quickly his merit shone and took positions such as legal counsel, assistant director general, deputy director general and in due course director general in 2008. Um, a great Australian, a, a great intellect, uh, brings great insight and vision to his work and already in a few short years has left a legacy and will continue to do so. Those comments uh, apply to our speaker tonight as well. Um, there's no doubt Robert French is a great Australian. He's an alumnus of the University of Western Australia with degrees in law and science. And after a 
uh, extended period in private practice at the bar, appointed first to the Federal Court of Australia. And then in the same year that Francis Gurry was elected Director General, Robert French was appointed the Chief Justice of the High Court of Australia. There's many of us in the audience who know his work well because we read his judgments closely and you can vouch for this statement that he also brings to his work great intellect and great insight. Uh, many of us will have had a moment in reading uh, one of his honours judgments where suddenly it's like a big torch from behind has been shone on the page and an issue that you thought you knew really well and was quite straightforward, uh, you realise was is straightforward but it's not the way you thought it, it's the way he thinks it and he has persuaded us. My moment like that was actually in the case University of Western Australia and Grey um, in a very long judgment when he was first instance judge in the federal court. Just a few paragraphs uh, had scales falling from my eyes. And it's quite poignant that that was the case because it was about an issue that I should really, really have known better. It was about the nature of what it is to be an academic working in an academic institution. Now, I, in my defence of getting it wrong, I can plead I was too close. I, I couldn't see the wood for the trees. Um, but his honours intellect and insight showed me the right answer, that the nature of the academic relationship isn't the same as a traditional employment one. You will have had your moments of insight like that from reading his judgments, and I'm sure by the end of this evening we'll have yet another set of insights that we can add to that list. So to allow that to happen, all I need to do is ask you to join with me in welcoming, welcoming to the podium to deliver the fourth Francis Gurry Lecture on Intellectual Property on the topic a public law perspective on intellectual property, the Chief Justice of the High Court of Australia, the Honourable Robert French. Thank you, uh, Professor Christie, uh, Professor Evans, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I had uh, wondered about the possibility of giving some sort of cosmic perspective to intellectual prop um, property by um, asking whether when uh, God forbade Adam and Eve from eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he was trying to protect a trade secret. <laughs> if so, the original sin was an infringement of intellectual property and we've been paying for it ever since. Had we not done it, of course, we would be in Eden and there wouldn't be such a thing as intellectual property and this lecture wouldn't be happening. Now, ordinarily, when I deliver a public lecture named in honour of somebody, it's somebody who's either deceased or considerably older than me and likely to be deceased shortly. <laughs> the Francis Gurry Lecture honours a person who is alive and actually younger than me, and so far as I know, quite well. <laughs> Francis Gurry has been, since October 2008, the director of the World Intellectual Property Organisation. He's had a distinguished uh, career in the field of intellectual property including a period as a member of the academic staff of this university and has continued that association as a professorial fellow at the Faculty of Law. I'm pleased to be able to deliver this lecture named in his honour and in recognition of the importance of the field in which he has so substantially contributed and continues to contribute. To consider public law and intellectual property together is a little like undertaking a wrestling match with Proteus. The object of such an exercise in Greek mythology was to hold fast to the shape-shifting old man of the sea until he yielded a true prophecy. Now, Menelaus succeeded in that task. I'm no Menelaus. Indeed, the shape of the topic has shifted upon reflection. It might more accurately be uh, styled intellectual property as an emanation of public law. Fortunately, true prophecy is not the purpose of this lecture. My modest goal is to provide occasion for reflection on the important intersection between the nature and purposes of intellectual property law and the rights to which it gives rise, the public policy underpinning them, and their constitutional and administrative law dimensions. Given that this lecture is in honour of the director of the uh, World Intellectual Property Organisation, it seems a fairly safe course to adopt the non-exhaustive definition of intellectual property which is set out in the convention establishing that organisation and which includes rights relating to literary, artistic and scientific works, performances of performing artists, rather quaintly phonograms and broadcasts, inventions in all fields of human endeavour, scientific discoveries, industrial designs, trademarks, service marks and commercial names and designations, protection against unfair competition and all other rights resulting from intellectual activity 
in the industrial, scientific, literary, or artistic fields. Public law is a term of contested definition and utility. For present purposes, it means the field of law which has to do with the exercise by public officials of powers, rights, privileges, obligations, and immunities created by law for public purposes. At its highest level, public law, according to that definition, is the law of the Constitution, conferring upon three branches of government, legislative, executive, and judicial powers, respectively. Statutes made under that Constitution may confer on officers of the executive government powers to do various things affecting the subject and relevantly for present purposes, the power to create, vary or revoke entitlements or property rights where legal criteria for the exercise of such powers are satisfied. And in the field of the common law in which aspects of intellectual property law find their origins, there are rules which would understand, which would un answer the description of public law in its broadest sense. Focusing on intellectual property statutes in Australia, they confer public functions on officers of the Commonwealth. The Patents Act creates the Office of Commissioner of Patents. Various powers and duties are conferred on the Commissioner, which includes such things as the grant of standard and innovation patents, their extension, the grant of patents of addition, and the revocation of patents. The Registrar of Trademarks is a statutory officer of the Commonwealth created by the Trademarks Act and he has powers including the acceptance or rejection of applications for registration, the registration of trademarks, the cancellation of registrations, and the correction of the register. And similarly, there is a registrar, registrar of designs under the Designs Act. The Copyright Act does not condition the rights it creates upon the decisions of public officers, but specific statutory function, functions are conferred under that Act on the Copyright Tribunal the Chief Executive Officer of Customs, the Minister who determines whether uh, a society is to be declared a collecting society and so forth. The powers and duties conferred upon officers of the Commonwealth under those statutes are constrained by the criteria for their exercise and the controls generally applicable to statutory discretions or duties. Their exercise take, and discharge of their duties takes place in the field of public law. In addition to such administrative and judicial appeal rights as are created by those acts, they, uh, the exercise of the, the powers and the decisions made under those acts attract the general supervisory jurisdiction of the High Court under Section 75.5 of the Constitution, of the Federal Court under Section 39B of the Judiciary Act and under the provisions of the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act 1977. Against that background, let me reflect for a, a little while upon the purposes of intellectual property law. The rights referred to in the WIPO Convention definition of intellectual property uh, do not exist as legal rights except as creatures of municipal legal rules. They can be described as proprietary in character. Indeed, in Australia, the rights created by patents by registered trademarks and registered designs are expressly designated <coughs> as, sta as personal property under the statutes. Those rights and copyright can be assigned, they can be the subject of licenses or securities or other myriad dealings that are possible with transmissible property. This raises the question whether the creation of tradable rights is the ultimate purpose of all intellectual property laws. If the answer to that question is yes, then applying the philosophical taxonomy used by Professor Peter Drehos, it might be said, as he wrote in 1996, that proprietarianism is the dominant normative influence on intellectual property law and policy today. On the other hand, if intellectual property rights are created as a means to publicly beneficial ends, then the underlying purpose may properly be characterised as instrumental. And of that approach, Professor Drahos said, the practical import of the theory would be that the interpretation of intellectual property law would be driven in a systematic fashion by the purpose of that law rather than more diffuse moral notions about the need to protect pre-legal expectations based on the exercise of labour and the creation of value. <coughs> 
In Dr Gurry's acceptance speech to the General Assembly of WIPO on his appointment as Director General in 2008, he clearly identified with the instrumental approach, observing that intellectual property is not an end in itself. It is an instrumentality for achieving certain public policies, most notably through patents, designs and copyright, the stimulation and diffusion of innovation and creativity on which we have become so dependent, and through trademarks, geographical indications and unfair competition law, the establishment of order in the market and the countering of those enemies of markets and consumers, uncertainty, confusion and fraud. All that being said, the public purposes of intellectual property laws and the merits of those purposes are contested and contestable. That phenomenon is not only of interest to the academy and the legal profession and people who practice in the field. It is a matter of concern for policy makers, rights holders and the wider public for at least two reasons. Firstly, as a general proposition, it is difficult to secure respect for and enforce rights deriving from laws which lack moral clarity. A law has moral clarity when its public beneficial purpose is capable of explanation in relatively straightforward terms to those whom it binds. It is a fact of contemporary society that the complexity of some of our laws obscures their public purposes. Second, and related to the first, is the complexity of the issues thrown up by questions arising out of the content of intellectual property rights, which questions may have no single correct answer and no underlying consensus about purpose. Professors Bohannon and Hovenkamp, Professor Hovenkamp of the Hovenkamp and Arida text on uh, antitrust law, have recently argued in a book published this year that in the United States, intellectual property laws have been the subject of special interest capture and thereby have become more disconnected from their purpose of promotion of innovation. Now, they contend the, pub, the, the classic public choice paradigm clearly favours IP rights holders. They are fewer in number, have individually greater stakes and typically have interests that are more homogenous. On the other side, the users of IP rights tend to be more numerous and heterogeneous. As a result, rights holders are much better organised than IP users and communicate their wishes to Congress much more effectively. Whether or not the second concern is directly reflected in the Australian experience may be a matter for debate involving political scientists, lawyers and economists amongst others. It is difficult to see why it would not apply, particularly having regard to the found formulation of obligations assumed by states including Australia under international conventions, treaties and free trade agreements which are then translated into domestic law. Intellectual property laws create rights which are based upon intellectual or creative activity. Their original justifications do not lie in some antecedent grand theory of natural law. Uh, by way of example, the ancestors of the modern patent were the monopolies granted as a form of patronage, particularly in the reign of James I. Their abuse led to the enactment in 1624 of the statute of monopolies which declared all monopolies void, subject to the exception in section six for any letter, patent and grant of privilege for the making of any manner of new manufactures within this realm to the true and first inventor and inventors of such manufactures, which others at the time of making such letters, patent and grants shall not use. Like an outdated technology which is not replaced because the sunk costs are too high, the manner of new manufacturing in section six still forms part of the definition of patentable invention in section 18 of the Patents Act of 1990. Nevertheless, its purpose uh, in its origins is clear enough. As Cornish, Llewellyn and Applin observe of section six in the seventh edition of their text on intellectual property, the terms of the section make it plain that an act of economic policy was intended the objectives were the encouragement of industry, employment and growth, rather than justice to the inventor for his intellectual percipients. On the other hand, in the field of trademarks, Professor Drehos has made a point about the divergence 
of the right from its original purpose, observing that within trademark law, proprietarian beliefs manifest themselves in an expanded view of what may be used as a trademark. More things in the negative commons are now capable of serving in the trademarks, serving the trademark proprietor. Under old trademark legislation, only visible marks of some kind were eligible for registration. Modern trademark law admits colour, sound, smells and tastes to the category of trademark signs. And I'll mention a little later uh, the uh, metaphysical problems that one faces in trying to determine uh, the uh, inherent characteristics of a shape trademark as applied to a small confectionery known as the Millennium Bug. Professor Drahos concluded that trademarks become tradable entities in their own right that serve the interests of their owners. The importance of consumer and public interest in trademark law, which was recognised in early trademark thinking, quietly slips from view. Importantly, there is no judicial doctrine which provides overarching protection for the products of intellectual effort. In Compromise Sociedad Limitada and Nike, Interna Nike International Limited, the court, in a unanimous judgment, affirmed as an authoritative state, statement of contemporary Australian law the observation by Justice Dixon in Victoria Park Racing and Recreation Grounds Limited and Taylor in 1937 that courts of equity have not thrown the protection of an injunction around all the intangible elements of value, that is, value in exchange, which may flow from the exercise by an individual of his powers or resources, whether in the organisation of a business or undertaking or the use of ingenuity, knowledge, skill or labour. This is sufficiently evidenced by the history of the law of copyright and by the fact that the exclusive right to invention, trademarks, designs, trade name and reputation are dealt with in English law as special heads of protected interests and not under a wide generalisation. In their discussion of the scope and purpose of the Trademarks Act 1955 in Campomar, their honours characterised Australian trademarks law as having manifested from time to time a varying accommodation of commercial and the consuming public's interests. The relevant interests include those of consumers in recognising a trademark as a badge of origin of goods or services and avoiding deception or confusion. The trader's interest lies in the protection of goodwill through the creation of a statutory species of property and turning that property to valuable account through assignment or licensing. And other interests, including those of traders who have no registration but claim to have built up common law rights which would be protectable in a passing off action. Of these and the public interest generally, their honours said, for present purposes, it is significant that the balancing of all these interests has been struck differently between one statute and the next as markets and trade methods and practices have changed. What that phenomenon can engender is dispute between different interest groups about the true purpose of intellectual property laws. There is contention about the normative basis or bases for intellectual property laws today, and in some quarters, their very merits. The spillover of that debate from the battlefields of the cognoscenti into what might be called the intellectual commons is demonstrated by an online dictionary called Your Dictionary, the dictionary you can understand. It shows its reader how to give an how to use any given word in a sample sentence. The sentence examples it offers for the words normative include, quote, recent debates about intellectual property rights have been marked by a spurt of critiques aimed at the very normative basis of intellectual property. So if you want to use normative, that's how you can use it. <laughs> and impress your friends. A normative basis for an intellectual property right is necessary for its moral clarity. The practical significance of an understanding of the reason for an intellectual property right may be found in the search for effective anti-piracy messages in DVDs. Professor Robert Stevens, Professor of Commercial Law at University College London, made the point recently in an essay entitled Rights and Other Things. Discussing what he called private rights created for instrumental purposes, he, sh he referred to a shift in the anti-piracy messages on DVDs of Hollywood films. The long established message of the kind with which I think we are all familiar shows a leather jacketed youth breaking into a Mercedes Benz and the words 
uh, you wouldn't steal uh, a car. Um, uh, this kind of um, uh, uh, message, incidentally, was, uh, was satirised recently, and it's been posted up on YouTube. There's a cartoon character with which some of you might be familiar called Bender, who's a little robot. And Bender is a rather uh, felonious or kleptomaniac uh, robot. Anyway, they have this, 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 this clip in which uh, the voiceover is saying to Bender, uh, you wouldn't steal a sapphire. And you see Bender taking a sapphire out of some <laughs> embedding in which it is. You wouldn't steal five sapphires. And so then you see Bender taking five sapphires out. And then the, the, the crescendo continues. Well, where would you draw the line? And Bender says, I wouldn't rip a beating human heart out of a living person. <laughs> and, then the message, and then the message goes, well, then you wouldn't download a movie. <laughs> and then Bender says, oh, I forgot. I did rip a beating human heart out of someone. <clears throat> the moral force of the theft analogy is weak because, as Professor Stevens points out, in a world which is not one of limitless abundance, we need rules for determining who is entitled to physical things. But these rules of first possession have little application to ideas or information which cannot be possessed. He points to a more recent example of an anti-piracy message developed by the United Kingdom Industry Trust for Intellectual Property Awareness, which uses satire under the title, You Make the Movies, to convey the proposition that infringing copyright deprives producers of the revenues that enable them to make good films. Now, having read that passage in Professor Stevens' essay, I went home and picked up a DVD which I'd just bought from um, JB Hi-Fi. It was a B-grade Sean Bean movie, but they had a very soft spot for Sean Bean ever since he was beheaded in Game of Thrones. <laughs> and I checked out the, uh, the message uh, on this DVD. There was nothing about theft. There was nothing about... Uh, you're going to improve the industry if you don't download this. All there was, and it was really consonant with his character, was a threat of fines or incarceration if you did. The jury is no doubt still out on the effectiveness of such messages, particularly since they would appear to be directed in the first instance at people who've paid for their DVDs. <laughs> the hurdle that has to be overcome by even the most sophisticated anti-piracy message is that the actions of the community uh, the sections of the community, I'm sorry, likely to engage in infringement of film copyright do not see it as harming individuals. The anti-piracy message is clearer when it can be related to the individual creator of the work. Take this example from Lewis C.K., an American performer who made a video of his performance for online purchase for $5, accompanied with this message. Please bear in mind that I am not a company or a corporation. I am just some guy. I paid for the production and posting of this video with my own money. I would like to be able to post more material to the fans in this way, which makes it cheaper for the buyer and more pleasant for me. So please help me keep this being a good idea. I can't stop you from torrenting. All I can do is politely ask you to pay your five little dollars, enjoy the video, and let other people find it in the same way. Now that's what I call a message with moral clarity. The normative question, why is it wrong to infringe a person's intellectual property rights may be susceptible of more than one answer, depending upon the nature of the right and its legislative infrastructure. Sometimes it may be that there is no clear answer because the legislation which supports and qualifies the right has been influenced by more than one normative consideration reflecting the agendas of particular interest groups. Indeed, in some cases, the term normative may be too grand to apply to the result of such influences on the legislative process. Intellectual law, of course, is not unique in that uh, respect. The challenge of interpretation of intellectual property legislation, reflecting compromises not informed by a single normative model, was illustrated in Stevens and Kabashiki Kaisha Sony Computer Entertainment, a case I remember because I was reversed in the High Court. <laughs> The case concerned the interpretation of a provision of the Copyright Act which provided for civil remedies against the vendors of circumvention devices, being devices whose purpose was to circumvent or facilitate the circumvention of technological protection measures. And the term technological protection measure was defined. Uh, so uh, you could, you're only found to be guilty of selling a circumvention device if the thing it was directed to was a technological protection device. So everything turned on whether it was a technological protection device. And 
many of you will remember, the case was about Sony Playstations. In those Playstations there was a thing called a, a boot ROM which would read the CD you put in. If it was a, a legitimately purchased CD, it would have an access code and it would let you play. If you would burned the CD and CD-ROM and put it in, it wouldn't have the access code on and so you wouldn't be able to play it because the boot ROM would recognise that. And the uh, the uh, object of the circumvention device was to trick the boot ROM into thinking it had read the access code and so you could go ahead and play with a burnt CD-ROM. Um, in the event, uh, the court held that the, uh, the combination of the ROM and the access code were not uh, a technological protection device. In the judgments, there were reflections upon the influences affecting the evolution of the Copyright Act and the approach to its interpretation. In the joint judgment of Chief Justice Gleeson, Justices Gummer, Hayden, Hay Hayden and Hayden, their honours referred to the requirement to construe the Act according to its underlying purpose or object, but they found little in the way of useful indicators of statutory purpose. The extrinsic materials gave no clear indication of how the Bill for the Amendment Act, which had introduced these provisions, uh, uh, had uh, taken the final form that it did. And their honours said, indeed, the very range of the extrinsic materials with shifting and contradictory positions taken by a range of interest holders in the legislative outcome suggests that the legislative purpose was to express an inarticulate or at least not publicly disclosed compromise. Well, the difficulty of expressing an inarticulate compromise speaks, if I may say so, for itself. <laughs> Their honours cautioned that to fix upon one purpose and bend the terms of the definition to that purpose risked picking a winner, uh, which the legislation, when the legislature had stayed its hand from doing so, uh, with consequent risks of unintended consequences um, uh, where the substratum of the legislation was constantly changing technologies. Justice McHugh uh, also made reference to evidence that the legislative provisions concerned were the product of an agreement or a compromise, I'm sorry, agreed to or forced upon interest groups in the industry affected by the legislation. And Justice Kirby quoted Professor Rickardson's description of copyright as one of the great balancing acts of the law in which many balls are in play and many interests are in conflict. And using that metaphor, he went on to say, the multiplicity of participants and interests now involved in its rhythms inevitably affect the contemporary judicial task of resolving contested questions of interpretation of the Copyright Act. Intellectual property is a product of public law reflecting competing interests and norms whose resolution must necessarily occur at the political rather than at the judicial level. But the discernment of the balance that has been struck is not a straightforward matter. Where contested interpretations depend upon a view of where that balance is struck, the constructional choices may involve evaluative judgments. And that raises the general question of the relationship between statutory interpretation and public policy. Of course, as we all know, intellectual property rights are affected by traditional areas of the general law, such as contract, equity, torts, property, and so forth. For the most part, however, they are created by an array of acts and regulations which condition their existence on the satisfaction of a range of criteria and contestable decision-making processes uh, which involve public officials and ultimately judicial officers. Intellectual property rights created by law can also be regulated, modified and destroyed by law. Their scope and content is defined in the language of the law. In this respect, as Professor Rickardson has observed, matters of dry statutory and textual construction can have far-reaching economic and financial effects. The recent decision of the High Court in uh, Roadshow Films and INET, Proprietary Limited, will no doubt be seen by some as having significant economic or financial implications for film producers and distributors and for internet service providers. And that case, of course, involved the construction and application of a section of the Copyright Act which uh, provides, for, uh, provides that copyright's infringed by a person who, uh, not being the owner of the copyright authorises the doing in Australia of an act comprised in the copyright. And the question was whether an internet service provider, having been notified that one of its customers was uploading a copyright film using BitTorrent, uh, the BitTorrent system, had authorised infringement by failing to issue that user with a warning notice and, if necessary, terminating the provision of the service to that person. The focus in law was on the word authorised. The focus in fact was on its application in the case. 
In deciding such legal and factual questions, the court does not act on its view of what is a desirable public policy. As Justices Gummo and Haynes said, the history of the Copyright Act since 1968 shows that the Parliament is more responsive to pressures for change to accommodate new circumstances than in the past. Those pressures are best resolved by legislative processes rather than by any extreme exercise in statutory interpretation by judicial decision. And that approach is consistent with a more general proposition enunciated recently by the court in a case which had nothing to do with intellectual property but was all about jobs for teachers in South Australia. Uh, it's a case called Australian Education Union and the Department of Education and Children's Services. And there four justices of the court in a joint judgment pointed out that in construing a statute, it is not for a court to construct its own idea of a desirable policy, impute it to the legislature, and then characterise it as a statutory purpose. Now, moving from that, um, the, the issues of the interaction between purpose and interpretation, let's focus for a moment on the nature of some of the criteria that have to be applied in the official decision making that is done by officers of the Commonwealth acting under these statutes. The exercise of the interpretation um, um, of uh, intellectual property statutes and the exposition of the criteria they establish for the creation of rights will always be a matter of economic and or financial significance. However, the criteria are frequently cast in evaluative terms. Their application depends on the opinions of official decision makers, initially an administrative and ultimately, if the matter be disputed, judicial. There's probably no better example than the requirement in section 18, subsection one of the Patents Act of 1990, that an invention as claimed in any claim involving an inventive step when compared, I'm sorry, in any claim involve an inventive step when compared with the prior art base as it existed before the priority date of the claim. As has been explained by the High Court in the Alpha Farm case and subsequently in Lockwood and Doric number two, obviousness or lack of inventive step did not emerge as a ground of invalidity of a patent distinct from want of novelty until late in the 19th century. Uh, that common law ground eventually found its way into legislation in the United Kingdom and Australia with the enactment of our Patents Act in 1952. The threshold of inventiveness required was raised by the 1990 Act by requiring consideration as part of the common general knowledge and prior art of publicly available information. As was said in the joint judgment in Lockwood, the emergence of the independent requirement for an inventive step, first in case law, then in legislative requirements, has always reflected the ba balance of policy considerations in patent law of encouraging and rewarding inventors without impeding advances and improvements by skilled non-inventive persons. Now, there has been much judicial exposition of the variously stated statutory requirements for an inventive step in this and other jurisdictions. Verbal missiles have been exchanged around the globe about the way in which inventive step is to be assessed. In an essay written in 2010, Professor Anne Minotti discussed divergent approaches, particularly between the United Kingdom and Australia, in defining the appropriate level of inventiveness in patent law. She referred to the decision of the High Court in Alpha Farm which applied the test of inventive step under the Patents Act, which had been enunciated in Wellcome Foundation, in which case it was said, the test is whether the hypothetical addressee faced with the same problem would have taken as a matter of routine whatever steps might have led from the prior art to the invention, whether they be the steps of the inventor or not. Former Lord Justice Jacob in the Court of Appeal in language which typically was not understated, characterised the approach of the majority in Alpha Farm as over-elaborated and coupled with a massive citation of authority so as to have become metaphysical or endowed with unwritten and unwarranted doctrines, sub-doctrines or even sub-sub-doctrines. <laughs> now, much importance is understandably attached to the threshold of inventiveness required for patentability. There are times, however, when, in my view, given the inescapably evaluative nature of the decision that has to be made and the constructed perspective of a skilled but non-inventive worker in the field, there might be a question about whether the range of correct decisions within any two divergent verbal formulae overlaps and to what extent the difference matters. In administrative law, there is nothing unusual about the possibility 
that the exercise of a discretion or of an evaluative judgment may yield more than one possible outcome, neither of which can be said to be wrong in a sense that is judicially reviewable. It's not unusual in statutes conferring power on public officials to find that the power is con conditioned by the existence of a criterion which is ostensibly of a factual character, but when you examine it, involves value judgments by the decision maker. I'm not to be taken as placing the criterion of patentability that requires an inventive step in any particular category. Nevertheless, its evaluative character means that at least in marginal cases, two quite uh, different answers may reasonably be open. I make uh, the, uh, that observation on the basis of having had to undertake myself the exercise of judging at an appellate level. I think the last time I, uh, the question of inventive step, the last time I did that was in 2005 in a case concerning proceedings between the manufacturer of the drug Viagra and the manufacturer of its competitor uh, Cialis. Uh, incidentally, that was a case uh, in which uh, there was, um, there were very good counsel appearing. Uh, we were given uh, a very useful primer about the uh, uh, the, uh, the physiology involved. Uh, if we had hoped for an exploration of the uh, mystery and ecstasy of human love, we were sadly to be disappointed. <laughs> it was a protracted search for a workable erection that had, uh, uh, had uh, been the focus of um, uh, research over many uh, years. Uh, in that case, the obviousness judgment required consideration of a considerable body of prior art, including a number of publications in scientific journals which had predated the claimed invention of Viagra. Now, there, there were, of course, many opportunities for tasteless jokes to have been made in the presentation, and all counsel, to their credit, refrained from doing so. Uh, the only, uh, uh, the only um, observation which was made, and which I think does bear repeating, is that uh, the science demonstrated that the um, erectile process is initiated by a signal from the brain to a bundle of nerves, which then uh, generate this um, uh, free radical, which is a, a, a combination of nitrogen and oxygen, whose chemical symbol is NO. <laughs> and this was described as one occasion in which no means yes. Uh, there was uh, the key paper uh, recounted a dreadful experiment in which uh, strips of penile tissue had been taken from 21 men who'd been treated with prosthesis for impotence. The strips were mounted on wire in organ bath chambers and electrically, elect, electrically stimulated. And in the course of that experiment, uh, a relaxant response, which was what was being sought, uh, was enhanced by the addition of a particular chemical, a particular biochemical called zapronast. And this experiment was said to disclose the principle which made the invention of Viagra obvious. Um, a large number of researchers, medical specialists and pharmacologists gave evidence at trial. In the event, we concluded that the step to the claimed invention was not obvious in light of the prior art. Of course, the judgment we made involved hypothesising the perspective of a skilled but unimaginative worker with a PhD. Uh, the English courts came to a different conclusion. I met Lord Justice Jacob not long after we delivered that decision and was told, as one might expect, that we'd got it wrong. The case is a good illustration of the nature of the judgment, which is the focus I want to place on, uh, in this, uh, at this point, uh, the, judge, the nature of the judgment about obviousness. Importantly, it demonstrates that the existence or non-existence of the property right, when it is in contest, can depend upon the opinion of an official decision maker applying evaluative criteria. The task is not much easier when it comes to applying criteria for the registrability of uh, trademarks. And uh, I was going to say uh, something about a judgment uh, I wrote in a case concerning a thing called the Millennium Bug in Kenman Candy. It's some of the worst judicial prose I have uh, ever uttered, I think. And uh, Professor uh, Christie would have found not a torch but a dark light uh, when he read, uh, if he read this passage from my judgment, which said, the shape of the Millennium Bug involves a symmetrical disposition of projections, legs, and recesses, eyes. Theoretically, it may be the case that the number of possible symmetrical arrangements of projections and recesses is not infinite. Assuming that to be so, it is speculative, absent evidence, to draw conclusions about that number and whether the particular arrangement has any significant impact upon the access of other traders to the use of insect-like shapes as trademarks. 
I would like to think that that prose, appalling as it was, rested on a foundation of careful logic, fine distinctions, and notions of inherent quality. <laughs> now, having established, I hope, the uncontroversial proposition that intellectual property law is a field of public law informed, albeit not with great clarity, by public policy, but to which the courts apply the techniques of legalism, it is appropriate to turn briefly to its constitutional foundations in Australia. Now, these are shrouded in tedium, and in the paper I have uh, set them out at uh, some length. Interestingly, uh, one of the, uh, the uh, form of uh, power which eventually saw the light of day in our constitution uh, began with um, uh, uh, Sir Samuel, well, there was, a, there was an intellectual property power contained in the Federal Council of Australasia Act, conferred on the Federal Council of Australasia, which was set up uh, as a failed experiment, as it turned out, in 1885. Uh, to take references of power from the various colonies and it would be able to make laws with respect to patents and copyrights. Uh, that, that fell over. Uh, when uh, uh, the uh, convention debates were in the offing, uh, Sir Samuel Griffiths was having some fights of his own in Queensland with separatist movements and he actually prepared a federal constitution for Queensland, dividing it into three provinces and a united provincial government. And uh, his uh, draft constitution for the united uh, provincial uh, uh, government uh, included uh, lawmaking powers with respect to patents of invention, designs and trademarks and copyright as two separate powers. Uh, and had uh, the Federation of Queensland gone ahead, no doubt Queensland would have been issuing its own patents in due course. Um, there was virtually no discussion of the, um, of the patents power and copyrights and trademarks power at the conventions. Uh, the, uh, once the draft had been settled in 1891, it went through without any change, save for the relocation of the word and uh, from one part of it uh, to, uh, uh, to another. Um, but it did reflect a consensus that, uh, notwithstanding that all the colonies had their own intellectual property statutes of one kind or another modelled on English laws, uh, it did reflect a consensus that this was a matter for the national government. Of course, the power in section 5118 of the Constitution was drafted in an, era, in an era dominated by steam power, when electrical power was new, Newtonian physics and Euclidean geometry ruled, quantum theory, information technology, biotechnology were not known to the English language, expressions such as circuit layout, computer software, gene sequencing and genetic modification applied to plants and animals occupied an unimagined future world. However, while the concepts of copyrights, patents of inventions and designs, and trademarks would have been understood in terms of established categories of rights and established technologies, they were of their nature ambulatory, for they necessarily contemplated innovation. And that may be an explanation uh, for the fact that um, in section 51.5, where the, um, the Constitution confers power to make laws with respect to postal, telegraphic and telephonic services, the words and other like services are included, whereas they're not included in 51.18. Um, there's an interesting speculation incident in relation to 51.5 that the term other like services may have been included because some of the delegates, including Samuel Griffith and Inglis Clark, were aware of experiments concerning wireless telegraphy in Germany, which had been undertaken by Hertz at that time. Uh, the earliest decision on the power took a restrictive view of it, and that was the Union Label case decided in 1908. That was affected, of course, by the reserve powers uh, doctrine that, the, uh, that was prevailing at the time in the High Court. And the uh, majority in the court struck down uh, Part 7 of the Trademarks Act of 1905, which would have enabled the registration by any Australian worker or association of Australian workers of a distinctive mark indicating that the goods to which the mark applied had been produced by that worker or association. Uh, Chief Justice Griffith, Barton and O'Connor held that the mark was not a trademark within the meaning of section 5118 on the basis that the constitutional term should bear the technical meaning that it had in 1900. Um, on the other hand, uh, 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 Isaac Isaacs and Justice Higgins dissented, Higgins observing the usage in 1900 gives us the central type, it does not give us the circumference of the power. 
Now, notwithstanding the engineer's case and the uh, overturning of the uh, reserve powers uh, concept, uh, the um, uh, union label remained for nearly three quarters of a century, or over three quarters of a century, the only decision of the High Court which directly addressed the validity of a law said to have been made under Section 5118. However, the narrower approach which was adopted in that case was not reflected in decisions of the court in the latter part of the 20th century. So when uh, in 1988 the Commonwealth uh, enacted uh, a law called the Australian Bicentennial Authority Act and tried to um, uh, uh, confer on the Australian Bicentennial Authority the exclusive right to use words such as bicentenary, bicentennial, 200 years, Australia, Sydney and Melbourne, <laughs> in conjunction with the figures 1788, 1988 or 88, um, uh, the, uh, it was conceded in argument that there might have been an increase in the denotation of the power since the union label case had been decided. At that time, the concept of a trademark uh, in the uh, relevant statute had been extended to a mark distinguishing services as well as goods, and Chief Justice Mason, Dean and Gordron said, if we bear the development in mind, it is possible to say, consistently with the majority and minority judgments in the union label case, that the two essential characteristics of a trademark are A, that it has the capacity to distinguish particular goods and services, and B, that the proprietor of the mark has some connection with the goods and services. And that observation then found its way into the definition of um, trademark in section 17 of the Trademark Act of 1995. Uh, in the tape manufacturer's case, uh, in 1993, the court held, albeit without much elaboration, that the provisions of the Copyright Act, which imposed a royalty on vendors of blank tapes, was a law which had a clear relevance to or connection with the subject of copyright, even though Quick and Garren had only thought of copyright when they were commenting on section 5118 as referring to protections conferred on authors and artists in respect of literary and artistic works. The content of the copyright power, notwithstanding the union label case and the general approach to construction adopted there, was not going to be confined by the technologies of the 19th century. The scope of the power was touched on again, although again not contentiously, in the Nintendo case concerning the Circuit Layouts Act, which created intellectual property rights in circuit layouts and displaced the protections otherwise available under Copyright and Designs Act. Importantly, Six of the justices in a joint judgment said, it is of the essence of that grant of legislative power that it authorises the making of laws which create, confer and provide for the enforcement of intellectual property rights in original compositions, inventions, designs, trademarks and other products of intellectual effort. What is interesting is that the passage was footnoted by a reference to Brisland's case, which was a decision about section 51.5. Uh, uh, that is the extending of the application of that to wireless broadcasting under the general rubric of other like services. The constitutional dispute in that case, that is Nintendo, had been whether the Act infringed the just terms requirements of the Constitution under Section 5131. It's not necessary to reflect on that aspect of the judgment here and for reasons which might be obvious to some of you, I'm not going to be saying much about just terms compensation uh, tonight. It is, however, interesting to note that the Circuit, Circuit Layouts Act was passed in anticipation of a proposed treaty on intellectual property in respect of integrated circuits and followed the draft of what was expected to be the form of the treaty, uh, 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 the form that the treaty was to take. There was no discussion of the limits of the power under 5118 and its capacity to encompass new forms of intellectual property um, uh, protection. And then we came, of course, to the Grain Pool case, the Plant Varieties Act, and the new kind of patent protection created by that Act. The plaintiff's argument in that case was that the operation of 5118 was limited by certain traditional principles of patent law. In particular, the plaintiff submitted there were fixed minimum requirements for the intellectual effort required of inventors with respect to novelty and inventive step, and that the term patents imported a constitutional requirement about the scope of the monopoly rights which must be granted and limited permissible statutory qualifications on them. The court rejected those arguments and uh, after noting the reference to Brisland's case back in Nintendo, 
They said, this serves to emphasise a point of significance in the present case, later developments in scientific methods for the provision of telegraphic and telephonic services were contemplated by section 51.5. Likewise, it would be expected that what might answer the description of an invention for the purposes of section 51.18 would change to reflect the developments in technology. And so with the grain pool case, uh, reflecting what was already a clear movement in thought up to that time, uh, the uh, power uh, conferred by Section 5118 was seen as adequate to uh, respond to developments in technology. Uh, pending uh, uh, that uh, case and preceding that case and Nintendo, of course, there had been proposals to try and extend the scope of Section 5118 in the Constitutional Convention in the 1970s and by the Constitutional Commission uh, in 1988 under the chairmanship of Sir Maurice Byers, who wanted to extend Section 5118 and add the words and other like protection for the products of intellectual activity in industry, science, literature and the arts. Uh, well, it uh, never got up, it was never really, never put to a referendum and in any event, uh, the need for it may not have been, may not be quite uh, as uh, pressing in the light of the decisions to which I have referred. Now I've focused on section 5118, uh, but uh, there is a question uh, about the uh, significance or the relative significance of that power and the uh, external affairs power in the field of intellectual property uh, generally. As we know, today's world is replete with conventions, treaties, free trade agreements relating to intellectual property protection. Uh, and these, uh, uh, Australia is a party to many of those uh, conventions and agreements which arguably attract the application of the external affairs power under section 5129 of the Constitution. Andrew Stewart has uh, written that although Nintendo and Grainpool have plainly liberalised the interpretation of section 5118, the possibility remains that a particular measure may be taken to fall between the cracks of the specific terms it uses. Hence it is likely that the Commonwealth will continue its now established practice of seeking to rely on the external affairs power in section 51, 24, 29 of the Constitution as a fallback. This may be used to implement protective regimes which are the subject of an international treaty or agreement to which Australia is a party. It's arguable today that the external affairs power is or is uh, capable of doing more than pick up things which have fallen between the cracks of the power conferred by section 51. Uh, 18. Although it may be that there is a point of distinction between the two in that 5118 is concerned with, um, is a power to make laws with respect to designated subject matters. If you're implementing a treaty or a convention or an agreement under the external affairs power, you will of course be, your implementation will be informed by the purpose of that treaty or convention or agreement and that may raise some other question. Now, uh, as I said before, I shall acknowledge that I have made no reference to the interaction between intellectual property rights created by laws made pursuant to section 5118 and the requirement for just terms in respect of the acquisition of property which is imposed by section 5131. That topic is the subject of a decision reserved before the court at the present time and therefore it would be inappropriate to make any comment on it. Finally, can I briefly refer to the uh, uh, coverage of um, uh, the amenability of decisions made under the uh, intellectual property statutes to judicial review and the various ways in which uh, that uh, occurs. As I've emphasised at the outset, the creation, the modification, the revocation, the cancellation of intellectual property rights depend ultimately upon decisions taken by public officials exercising functions created by the um, uh, relevant statute. Those functions are administrative, not judicial. They are officers of the Commonwealth. As officers of the Commonwealth, they are subject to the jurisdiction, the constitutional jurisdiction conferred on the High Court by section 75.5 in all matters in which a writ of mandamus or prohibition or an injunction is sought against an officer of the Commonwealth. And that jurisdiction is constitutionally entrenched. It cannot be abrogated by statute. And it provides for the possibility of review for jurisdictional error being in very broad terms an error by a decision maker which vitiates the purported decision. It can include a mistake 
uh, which causes a decision maker to identify a wrong issue, ask a wrong question, ignore relevant materials or irrelevant materials. A decision informed by bad faith or a breach of the applicable rules of procedural fairness will also be reviewable for jurisdictional error. A common form of jurisdictional error is the misconstruction or misinterpretation by a decision maker of a statutory criterion or condition upon which the existence of the decision maker's powers depend. And so in its application to intellectual property statutes, jurisdictional error may arise where the commissioner or registrar makes a decision based upon a misinterpretation of his or her own powers or duties. The Federal Court of Australia has an analogous uh, and equivalent statutory jurisdiction created by Section 39B of the um, uh, Judiciary Act and, then, uh, and also the general judicial review uh, powers conferred by the uh, Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act. Judicial review, of course, has its limitations. Judicial review will ordinarily only yield a remedy that requires the decision maker to go back and do the job properly. It doesn't get you, in the ordinary course, a substituted decision. So merits review of an administrative or judicial character under statutory appeals provide uh, that kind of outcome. Uh, the availability um, of judicial review, both constitutionally and under the Judiciary Act and the ADJR Act, attracts to official decision making under the intellectual property statutes the full panoply of administrative law in relation to judicial review of official decisions. While questions of application to particular classes of decision may arise from time to time, the character of intellectual property as a field of public law is no more important, is no more apparent than in this important area of intersection with general administrative law. In conclusion, for its practitioners and those who study and write about it, the field of intellectual property law is absolutely engaging and absorbing. It involves a unique intersection of law, public policy and public law with the products of human creativity and ingenuity. As I once told a, uh, a group of uh, patent attorneys and licensing executives, uh, commiserating with them that all of us intellectual property practitioners are very boring people, so that at least in this field you get to meet some very interesting people. <laughs> uh, some may think we are better off without intellectual property law. Uh, perhaps one day we will be. For my part, I'm not anxious to see its arrival. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. That was a typically broad and deep uh, canvas of the key points of intersection of public law and intellectual property and uh, did shed much light indeed. Um, His Honour has kindly agreed to remain at the podium for some uh, minutes uh, whilst comments or discussion from the audience occurs. Um, I invite that and to allow you to do that, we do have some microphones in the two aisles. So anyone who would like to make a comment or a discussion, be grateful if you could indicate so. A microphone will be brought to you. When you make your comment or discussion, can you um, recognise two things, please? Firstly, be grateful for us all if you could identify yourself. And secondly, uh, we would be grateful if you could recognise that there may be some matters on which His Honour uh, doesn't wish to or is indeed unable to uh, comment, and of course he reserves the right not to do so, um, and we recognise and respect that. So if you have observations or comments you'd like to raise about the matters heard, please indicate. Yes, there's one. Your Honour, uh, I'm John Van Setten. I'm a science graduate of this university and an MBA from the business school here. Freeways um, are put in to uh, expedite uh, travel by road vehicles from Melbourne to the suburbs and vice versa. I was wondering if you could tell us, um, given that uh, the wealth of a nation depends on the innovativeness of its people, is there some way that the IP laws can be um, um, less constrained, perhaps, um, to, to make us a more innovative nation? I think that's the kind of question which um, you need to ask a policymaker. One of the good things about being a judge, and I, I thought I'd tried to rather emphasise it in this talk, <laughs> was that we're not into policy, um, because that's too hard. 
uh, I, I'm sure uh, there are. Uh, the problem is, of course, that, um, uh, and it's the issue of complexity. It's the issue of um, um, of um, uh, accommodating competing interests, legitimate interests, in uh, in drafting statutes. That leads to uh, uh, difficulties and associated transaction costs uh, in their uh, in their application. Um, and uh, I think uh, uh, perhaps perhaps there's one caveat I should uh, put on that. And it's occurred to me more than once. Speaking from a judicial perspective, I'm looking at, if you like, it's like the criminal law judge. I'm looking at the worst part of the system. I'm looking at the disputes and the things that go wrong uh, and end up in courts. Uh, the case to which uh, um, uh, uh, Professor Christie referred earlier on at the University of WA and Gray. That was a fight which went on for 50 days, cost millions and millions of dollars, and involved the kind of judgments that I, that I mentioned earlier, evaluative judgments of various kinds. Actually, I, uh, I don't recommend you read the judgment. It's really like a bad airport novel because there's quite a lot of university politics in it. <laughs> um, but the, uh, the that, that kind of case is, if you like, the tip of an iceberg. And beneath that iceberg, I suspect there are a lot of people who are just getting on in a transactional sense with business and not worrying about the complexities. So before I assume the premise on which, accept the premise on which your question is put, I think I would need to know a bit more about how the system is actually working in fact. I remember many years ago when, when I was still a practitioner and doing some intellectual property work, I went along to conferences and I was asking people at the time, has anybody done an assessment of the costs and benefits of the patent system? I know there have been ongoing debates about it, but I don't know if anybody's ever actually come up with an answer uh, which everybody can agree on. So I certainly can't solve that problem if there is a problem. Uh, my name's Bryce Menzies, I'm an entertainment lawyer. Um, the, the, one of the conflicts I have uh, quite often within my practice is the uh, fair use provisions of the Copyright Act, which are clearly um, are trying to balance the, uh, well, the fair use of copyright and, and the owner's rights. Um, our current, um, I might be right, I think there is a, 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 a judicial, um, you know, some inquiry going on, there seems to be always one about fair use, and one of the things that will be um, uh, compared is the American system, which is uh, uh, the American Copyright Act just uh, has a sort of a broad fair use provision, whereas the Australian Copyright Act has a list uh, of uh, uh, specific examples. Um, for example, um, use of uh, you can film an architectural work without breaching the um, copyright of the architect, which I've got to say is a, a relief to my clients. Um, how do you think, in, in light of what you've said about judges not making policy? Um, is that, a, you know, if we were to revert to the American system where it's as much open and it's really used, you know, the judges are looking at saying, well, that is in the public purpose or that, how do, do, you, do you think that's the, the good idea or a bad idea or do you think the judges will have to change their nature and look at the policy of... of well, if you, if you change, if, you cha if, if what you're saying is uh, that what is desirable is a kind of broader discretion rather than a tick list approach, uh, then judges are used to dealing with that and they develop um, a kind of common law within a broad statutory um, formula on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and hopefully uh, they develop it within a, within a framework that everybody regards as more or less, more or less consistent. Um, so uh, there, there's no, uh, if you like, in principle problem with uh, a statute conferring that kind of developmental um, uh, responsibility on the judiciary. A classic example uh, out of intellectual property is, um, uh, outside the field of intellectual property, is Section 52 of the Trade Practices Act. You know, there's a broad statutory thing that says a corporation shall not in trade or commerce in engage in uh, misleading or deceptive conduct. Well, it's actually now Section 18, I think, of the Competition and Consumer Act. I'm, I'm still living in the past. <laughs> uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, there you'd see a, 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 a really interesting case of a kind of common law development of that formula in a whole variety of directions, including uh, causes of action which are analogous to but require you to prove less than passing off 
Um, so that kind of approach is entirely legitimate, I think. And then, of course, if the parliament decides that the judges have pushed too far in a direction that they hadn't intended, they can tweak it. And another good example in the case of uh, misleading and deceptive conduct was when judges started holding newspapers liable for getting their stories wrong. And, of course, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, shocks and horrors uh, emanated from that. And so we had Section 65A, which was the, uh, the safe harbour for information providers, which was a legislative response to a particular judicial development. Anybody else uh, observation or comment? Uh, one over here. Thanks, Eva. Thank you. Mark Aberisk, uh, in-house IP counsel. I was wondering if, um, would you care to pass comment on whether the judiciary may consider their time would be better spent um, exercising their capacity to make judgment if the issue before them was whether a compulsory licence should be granted rather than the validity and infringement of a patent? I don't think I'd enjoy deciding whether a compulsory licence should be granted. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds too much like the kind of job that I used to, um, that I was facing on the competition tribunal. Yeah, uh, uh, and uh, I suspect that. Um, well, of course, that's the sort of uh, that's the sort of task that I think the Copyright Tribunal undertakes. And uh, uh, my former colleague Ian Shepherd was chairman of that for many years, and uh, it produced long and learned and uh, 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 financially excruciating judgments. No, I don't think I'd want to do that. <laughs> Opportunity for a comment or question with the Chief Justice of Australia going, and <laughs> as they say, we have. Oh, but I think, thank you. Uh, Mark Williams, a solicitor in Melbourne. Um, just a question about um, instead of a, a public law perspective, Your Honour, um, one on a, a rights based perspective. We, we do have international treaties, including the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, that speak of um, cultural expression. Uh, and individual right. Um, do you have any comment on that? Well, um, when you talk about um, uh, rights in that, are you speaking about an individual's right to the um, uh, a sort of a natural law concept of the individual's right to the um, products of their own labour? That that's, does seem to be enshrined in the declaration. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, I think the, um, the uh, uh, obviously the rights-based um, approach underlies uh, what um, Drahos called the proprietarian approach, which I mentioned early uh, in, in the speech. And uh, in fact, in his very interesting book, although it was written back in 1996, uh, he has a whole chapter about you know, how this sort of flows out of uh, Locke's theories of uh, natural rights and so forth. Uh, all I would say about that uh, is that, that those kinds of rights uh, are a legitimate element in the determination of what sort of legal protection uh, should be given uh, to them. But there is plainly a balance, especially if the kind of rights that you assert are, as, are creating a kind of negative liberty. That is to say that somebody else can't do something because of the exclusive zone of activity that you say you have uh, created. And uh, that's the kind of balancing exercise that we were, we were uh, discussing earlier uh, tonight. Uh, and then, of course, there is the, the public purpose element, the instrumentalism. So um, I don't think uh, I can do anything other than to say that uh, what you say is entirely legitimate. And certainly, um, the kind of um, rights that you mention uh, do have do find a place in uh, in international law. I don't think there's a property right mentioned as such in the ICCPR, but there's arbitrary deprivation and so forth, which is perhaps feeds into that mix. Thank you very much for for those. Um, I kept saying observations, comments, and everybody kept putting a question. But Your Honour, we're so generous in responding to all of them. We're very grateful.
I now would like to invite Mr Graham Cowan, the President of the Institute of Patent and Trademark Attorneys of Australia, to come and to conclude this evening. Thank you, Andrew. The Institute of Patent and Trademark Attorneys of Australia is very proud to be associated with the Francis Gurry Public Lecture on Intellectual Property. The lecture has become firmly established as a premier event in the Australian IP education and development landscape, and indeed in a very short period of time. The fact that it happened in such a short period of time is all the more pleasing. And testament to that position is the wonderful attendance here tonight that Andrew has already alluded to, um, as well as the eminence of the speaker and the calibre of the address that we've just witnessed. Indeed, they are reminders, if we needed the reminders, as to why the Institute Council has been and continues to be such an enthusiastic supporter of this event. It's not really part of my role here this evening, but I'd like to take the opportunity of expressing appreciation on behalf of the Institute, and dare I say, everybody that's here tonight, uh, to thank the Melbourne Law School um, for organising this event. And with particular thanks to Professor Andrew Christie. Without the Law School's attention to organisational detail and Professor Christie's enthusiasm, we would not have this event to celebrate. So thank you, um, Dean and Professor, for your efforts in getting us all here tonight. Your Honour, you have delivered a very wide-ranging and thought-provoking and entertaining, which collectively is quite a difficult task in the area of IP. You have talked about the strained and complex relationship between public law and intellectual property law. As we who have or aspire to have careers involving IP law are all too well aware, the mere mention of IP laws and rights now regularly invoke polarised views, both within the political and the public arenas. Dare I say, some might contend that IP laws are laws unto themselves, unanswerable to the good of public law, sometimes immoral and therefore of little public benefit. And as such, if not to be subject to the delete button, should at least be significantly tamed. All the while, those same commentators continue to enjoy the benefits of innovation and creativity from the existence of those very laws. As you have so eloquently explored this evening, IP laws legitimately, although uneasily, sit within the framework of public law. Proprietorial and private rights can be equitably balanced. And with that as a common goal, all stakeholders have the power to ensure future IP laws that operate for the mutual benefit of all of us. A good start might be a willingness to sensibly explore the purpose of those laws, including their moral purpose, a challenge indeed. Your Honour, on behalf of the Melbourne Law School, IPTA and other supporters of this event, we thank you very much for your address this evening. Would you please join with me in expressing appreciation in the usual way to his Honour for the time of us.